Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. This week, we're going to dive into a urologic emergency. And no, we're not talking about my favorite topic, renal colic. We're going to talk about priapism. Let's start a little historical here. The term priapism comes from the Greek god Priapus, who was the god of fertility. Makes a lot of sense. I strongly recommend, though, that you don't Google search Priapus when you're in a public place. So you get a lot of interesting images. Now, priapism is not the most common presentation, but I've seen about half a dozen in my career, and so I think it's good to have a basic understanding of the disorder and the treatment options that are in front of us. Priapism is defined as a prolonged pathologic erection of the penis for four hours or more in the absence of sexual desire. There will be dorsal penile erection with ventral flaccidity resulting from engorgement of the dorsal corpora cavernosa. There are two main priapism subtypes, low flow and high flow. Looking at the low flow, you basically see decreased venous outflow resulting from increased cavernosal pressure. When the cavernosal pressure exceeds the arterial pressure, ischemia starts to develop. The low flow variety is more common than the high flow, and it's typically accompanied by significant pain due to ischemia. In fact, many consider it to be compartment syndrome of the penis. The common causes in pediatric patients are sickle cell disease and leukemia, and in adults, it's intracavernosal injection of medications like pepaverine and PGE-1, anticoagulation can cause it, and then pharmaceuticals like SSRI, sedative hypnotics, erectile dysfunction medications, and then the illicit drugs like cocaine and ecstasy. High flow priapism, on the other hand, is obviously much less common, and it's due to excess arterial inflow resulting in priapism. It's often painless, and the common causes are either arterial laceration or spinal trauma. Because this acts like compartment syndrome of the penis, it's an emergency to have the patients drained. The longer the erection lasts, the more likely they'll develop penile fibrosis, impotence, or thrombosis and ischemia. Once you've identified the issue, we're going to start with basics. In some cases, hydration has been found to decrease sludging of blood, and it's been found to improve the priapism, so giving a crystalloid bolus isn't a bad idea. Before doing any procedure, though, you're going to want to get some analgesia on board. It's easy enough to give a slug of an opiate as a systemic analgesic, but it's often going to be ineffective. Instead, we should be performing dorsal penile nerve blocks. This can be done by landmarks or by ultrasound, and they're extremely effective. We'll drop a video link to an ultrasound guided nerve block in the show notes. Once you've achieved analgesia, you'll want to turn your attention to expeditious relief of the priapism. The longer the erection, the more likely they're going to develop ischemia leading to fibrosis and impotence. You can start with the non-invasive approaches, including things like warm compresses, which can produce vasodilation leading to improved blood flow, or terbutaline. Terbutaline can be given either orally or subcutaneously, and it's often recommended but there's not strong evidence to support its use. That being said, it's not unreasonable to give it a go since there's not a ton of side effects, but we shouldn't be delaying definitive treatment while we're waiting for tributylene to work. The typical dose here is either 5 to 10 milligrams PO or 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams sub-Q. In patients with sickle cell disease who present with priapism, we should consider exchange transfusion or partial exchange transfusion as these have been shown to be beneficial as well. If the non-invasive approaches fail, we're going to move on to intracorporeal injection of an alpha adrenergic receptor agonist, or we're going to consider aspiration and irrigation. We'll start with the intracorporeal injection, and typically we're going to be using agents like phenylephrine or epinephrine. 200 to 500 micrograms of phenylephrine diluted in 1 ml of NS is going to be injected intracorporeally. This dose can be repeated every 20 minutes up to three doses. Now, you can give more doses than three, but once you've gotten to three doses, you kind of have to say, it ain't working, time to move on to something else. Phenylephrine is preferred over epinephrine because it's got a lower cardiovascular side effect profile, and these drugs can travel into the systemic circulation, so we do need to think about that. Typically, the needle is either a 25 or 27 gauge, and it's going to be inserted into the corpora cavernosa at either 2 o'clock or 10 o'clock near the base of the penis. Now, you only have to go into one corpora because they communicate, so you don't have to inject both sides. If this doesn't work, the next move is to aspiration and irrigation. This is typically definitive, so some recommend that you can skip the injection and go straight to aspiration and injection, but I've had some success with the intracorporeal injection, so I would do that first. 
After prepping the skin thoroughly, a 19 gauge needle is placed into either corpora cavernosa. Remember again, you only have to go into one because the two communicate. As you advance the needle, you're going to aspirate until you retrieve dark blood. You're going to continue to aspirate until the blood turns from dark to bright red or detumescence has been achieved. If it's successful, you can consider instilling 200 to 500 micrograms of phenylephrine into the corpora to promote smooth muscle contraction and increased venous outflow from the penis. If detumescence isn't achieved by aspiration, you can consider injecting small volumes of dilute phenylephrine into the corpora and letting it dwell. Again, we're trying to encourage the venous outflow by contracting that smooth muscle. The solution that's recommended here is dilute phenylephrine, about 10 milligrams in a 500 cc bag, giving you 20 micrograms per ml. Again, hopefully this is going to achieve that smooth muscle contraction and improve venous outflow. If none of these techniques work, you're going to want to get your urologist down to see the patient because they actually may have to go to the OR for placement of a shunt. On the other hand, if detumescence is achieved, you're going to put on a not too tight elastic bandage around the penis to discourage a further erection and then send the patient for urgent GU follow-up in a couple of days. Let's hit the take-home points before we wrap up. Priapism should be considered to be compartment syndrome of the penis. Ischemia and infarction can occur with prolonged priapism, and rapid treatment and detumescence is critical. Provide adequate analgesia early to facilitate the necessary interventions. Dorsal block of the penis is the most effective analgesic approach. Finally, don't delay aspiration and irrigation if more conservative measures fail, as complications are more likely to occur. Well, that's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net. We've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google+, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.